You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to this Monday Night Live on a Tuesday. I hope everybody had a fantastic Memorial Day weekend, Labor Day weekend. My apologies. Of course, you know the old brain synapses don't work too good for me. I hope everyone had a great weekend. Um, I didn't get to go on the water because, I don't know, Memorial Day and Labor Day weekend is the hardest one, at least in my area, to get out on because the few bodies of water that we have, it gets packed absolutely crowded with all the people that are trying to get on the water that one last time before they they shut down their boats for the year and i know the next couple of weeks it's just going to get less and less boat pressure everywhere which is a glorious thing for us anglers as as we get closer to winter we kind of get our lakes and our rivers back so i did something that's almost becoming a tradition now i went hiking on the appalachian trail uh last year i was able to basically break down most of Maryland and I finished that off. So I got done with Maryland and Harper's Ferry today. So I have one whole state down. Uh, My goal eventually is to hike the whole Appalachian Trail, but because I'm a person with a day job and a wife and stuff, I can't just peace out. I'm going to (laughs) go hike for for nine months. So I'm trying to do it slowly. So hopefully by the time I'm at least 86, I can say that I hiked the whole trail. And it's very, uh, I don't like. It's very, very, very nice to just kind of unplug from everything and just listen to nature. Granted, of course, I had my phone with me, and every now and then I would get updates, which was the world was on fire. And so I had to I had to do some kind of post, even though, even though I will say that uh that I really should have just unplugged completely. It was nice to figure out what was going on and the world was absolutely burning, which is uh which is interesting. We got Chris here says, uh, I listened to an interview with with Brad and I think he's basically marketing genius and the MPFL is going to have a huge niche market. I mean, well Chris, you kind of just stole my thunder there. <laughs> yeah. Uh as always guys, uh the number and I'm going to actually be pulling this bad boy up. This is a call-in show because of I don't want to bury the lead of what we're going to be talking about today. The call-in number is 667-307-8583. You guys can talk about whatever you want, but uh, let's not bury the lead here. Chris just kind of talked about it. It busted on Labor Day weekend, which is a very interesting time to kind of drop a bombshell like this, that the NPFL is going to be banning forward-facing sonar for the 2025 season. The big deal here, uh, it's insane how this has gone in the last, what are we going to say, like three or four weeks, a month really, leading up to the St. Lawrence, really between, I guess, like the last few weeks of July leading up to the, the Northern Swing. The huge ramp up that there was for banning forward facing sonar or controlling it somehow. But what's interesting to me is how the conversation has really ramped up from hey, guys, we need limitations. Limitations are needed. We got to limit forward facing sonar. And then it completely flipped to ban this shit outright. We need to get rid of this thing out of the sport 100%. It just felt like that happened overnight. Now, it could just be me. I'm just an idiot on YouTube. And maybe I just don't listen to the right sources. But it really felt like it kind of swung extremely hard real quickly from, well, let's have a nice middle ground of how can we limit this to make all sides happy to just let's get rid of it 100%. Now, I'm just talking about the broad conversation of forward-facing sonar, not exactly what is happening there with the NPFL. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to pull up this thing from the old Bass Blaster here. Let me share my screen. Uh, Just a little excerpt. I really like Kumar and what he does. So I thought I would would share this with everyone, and I will just read through this. Let me get that right there. Perfect. All right. Let me. Zoom in. There we go. So uh, Jay says here, uh, starting with the 2025 season, the NPFL will prohibit the use of real-time imaging units, commonly referred to as live forward facing during official practice and competition. Other sonar, e.g. 2D side scan and 360 will continue to be permitted. The use of the feature technology will be evaluated by a case by case basis. The 2025 NPFL championship will be conducted using the 2024 rules. Interesting. It's only fair that the anglers who qualify for the championship be allowed to compete under the same rules under which they qualified. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm actually, I completely agree with that, honestly. Let me blow that up a little bit more so it's a little bit bigger for you guys. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. 
There is no way to make every stakeholder happy uh, where a technology policy is concerned. Every sport has equipment rules to protect the player and the integrity of the game. As example, Major League Baseball does not allow aluminum bats so as to protect certain players on defense and to preserve the game's legacy. We're going to talk about that right there. As a guy that made his living off baseball for 15 years, we're going to talk about that. Uh, tournament bass fishing is not different in its need to protect the integrity and appeal of the game. We do not want competitive bass fishing to become a technological arms race. Interesting here. I don't know why I'm highlighting. It's already highlighted. We do not want to competitive bass fishing to become a technological arms race where anglers start stare at screens, targeting pixels, and losing their connection to the fish we love so much. Um... Yeah, and then again, guys, the uh, the phone number is six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. All right, I'm gonna get into my little old tirade here with all this stuff here because I got I got some interesting thoughts and I really like to get yours on this because I just want to break down before you know I actually flip it around. I'm gonna give you my broad opinion. I think what the MPFL doing here is actually a really insanely smart marketing decision. Out of the three, you're trying to create diversification and you're trying to differentiate yourself from everyone else. Chick Fil A basically did the same thing. Hey, guess what? We have religious beliefs. We're going to serve the best chicken sandwich on God's earth, and we're not open on Sundays. Come at me, bro. We're different. You like it or you don't. This is going to really, really be interesting to see what this does for them in the next two years. I say two years. This is important. I think there will be a viewer uptick next year, regardless. And I think people are going to use that as a straw man argument to say, aha, you see, it. it people don't like forward-facing sonar, blah, blah, blah. Yes, but that's because it's the first year. It'll be a novelty. Of course, people will tune into the first couple of events. I think a two or three year sample of the viewing data is the most mature way to look at it like this. Let's just see what happens over a broad spectrum of time if there is this huge bump in people that actually enjoy this. So just with that, I do think MPFL is a smart decision by them to do this. I think it's going to diversify it from everyone else, but let's not just completely go gaga when the numbers come out and there's a ton of people watching because that's probably what's going to end up happening because people are going to be fascinated to see how that all gets produced. Uh, let's see. We got it in there. Uh, we got CLAP. How will they really regulate this? I think that is a fantastic question. I am assuming if I was a betting man, they're just going to have to remove the transducer from the trolling motor. Because let's say you're trying to fish other circuits that allow forward-facing sonar. You can't just remove the black box. I think that would be a little too a little too much of encroachment, I think, personally. If they're going to say, like, yeah, you have to remove the black box completely from your boat, I think just removing it from the trolling motor and the transom of the boat should be perfectly fine, in my opinion. But, you know, hey, if you guys have another opinion, I'd love to hear that. Uh, we got Frank here. Give a legitimate reason to ban forward-facing sonar. Don't we all have creek slash bag limits? Creel slash bag limits? No, 100%. And this kind of gets into my, my first point here uh, that they make here. As an example, Major League Baseball does not allow aluminum bats uh, so to protect certain players. That argument is a health concern. So let's just break down the different arguments because I've seen this in the comments section everywhere, all over God's earth. Like, well, it's like aluminum bats in baseball. Well, let's break down that argument a little bit. Well, what does aluminum bat do? Aluminum bat is a safety concern first and foremost. So that if you give a Major League Baseball player that bat, the exit velocity of that ball will be so fast people will die. And I know people online with this forward-facing sonar debate really think people are dying and lives are on the line with forward-facing sonar. But that sadly is not true. I'm really sorry. This is not a terrorist weapon. This is not made by Hamas or anything. It's a little bit of a technology and I know it's scary, but no one is literally dying over this stuff. I promise you. So as a health concern, that's not the same thing. If you want to make the argument that having too many screens on a boat, it could be a health concern because you can't see obstructs your ability to view as you're driving. 100% agree with that. That is a really good concern in, in like a court of law. 100% agree with that. Now, but then he goes on with this thing, which is talks about the integrity of the game, the game's legacy. That is an interesting one that we could break down there, debating that. Let's break that down. So why don't you have an aluminum bat in baseball? Well, you don't have aluminum bat in baseball if you want to say the health concerns for some reason and just go straight to, we don't care. We're going to put the aluminum bats in there. We don't care if somebody's head just explodes off his body. Then what's the issue? It'll be stats. It'll be data. The bigger issue with baseball specifically when it comes to aluminum bats in that regard, if you want to take that side of the argument, is how it'll affect the data. People in baseball are so gaga over 
baseball stats and that like, well, Babe Ruth hit like this. And it's like, yeah. And he also ate 38 hot dogs, drank a ton of beer and then started to swing when people didn't even know how to throw a curveball back then. But they statistically, that's what they wanted to do. Um, uh, we got a foot. Is this here? We got, uh, uh, until I see statistics that forward facing sonar kills people. I don't think the baseball argument works. A hundred percent agree with that. Like, yeah, that's, that's the thing there with that. But I'm saying if his argument is more about like the data integrity, how like the numbers don't compare, that would be an argument that's interesting because your argument then is with forward facing sonar that it affects the stats that we care about the most. So example is with steroids and aluminum bats, the problem with them both, I think first and foremost is aluminum bats was a health concern because you could kill somebody. Steroids was because it was already an illegal substance. I saw that in the comment section before. So that's absolutely incorrect because it wasn't just that it gave you a, a performance enhancement. It was the fact that it was illegal to take it in the first place. That better comparison would be a forward facing center was illegal and people still use it. That would be like the steroid era. So, but let's take that away. The problem was it affected the Hall of Fame because of how people were catching fish or how people were hitting and getting home runs and stuff. So let's go with that there. The problem I have with that argument in baseball and in fishing is the advancement of sports in general. Because we're then talking about how it affects the record books and that it pads stats. That's basically the argument. Okay, cool. Well, LeBron James will have a different stats compared to his predecessors. Why? Because the time he was born in and that athletes right now are bigger, faster, smarter, and more intelligent. You have the internet, you have everything else. Stats should go up in a lot of regards when it comes to kind of that kind of stuff. And in fishing, I think there's an argument that could be made there with that, that if you're going to talk about it just from a statistical side, will it affect the stats? Yes, but the stats are going to be affected regardless because let's say you look at the St. Lawrence River. If you look at the St. Lawrence River, if you go to a lake like that back 20, 30 years ago, and you go now, the stats change. You have a lot more century belts. Regardless of forward-facing sonar, those stats would be adjusted there because some of these lakes just got that much better. So it's not, and my point is, it's not as cut and dry when it comes from stats in fishing as it is in baseball. Baseball, it's a lot easier to break down those stats, I think, and you can really get anal with those. But with fishing, when you're talking about a fishery, the population of the fish, that makes it a little bit harder, but I would love to have somebody come on the show and talk about that if you want to get into that uh, right now. Uh, we got another one here. Uh, they are releasing a Bluetooth device for the tip of your rod that allows you to control where your FFS sonar points, then focuses and follows your lure. There is no limit limits on. There is no limits to how far this can go. No, there's not, and I think that's where it comes down to the idea of the idea of putting limitations into the technology, which I 100% agree with. Again, the call number is 667-307-8583. I think limitations are great. Do I think there should be an outright ban? Why do people want an outright ban? That's where I want to try to get down into those arguments and really get into the weeds of the 100% outright ban. Because I feel like a lot of these arguments can be broken down a lot. Um, and, and then this is the other part I want to get into here. I see that we got a bunch of people calling in right now. This is what's interesting. We do not want competitive bass fishing to become a technology arms race where anglers stare at a screen targeting pixels and lose their connection to the fish we love so much. What the hell does that mean? And again, you know, guys, I'm going to I'm going to really pop the screen big here so you can read this with me. This is what's an interesting thing from the press statement. We don't want competitive bass fishing to become a techno technology arms race where anglers stare at, at a screen targeting pixels and losing their connection to the fish we love so much. What in the hell does that mean? So I'm going to give you I'm going to give you my thoughts and then we're going to be talking to uh, all the callers that we have lined up here. Uh, technology arms race. Okay, we are in one. Let's also understand that you decided now is the important time. Is it because you think the technology has gotten out of hand or is it because that there's people complaining as much as they are? When you say you're targeting pixels instead of connecting with the fish, that is a very interesting wording and that is very much leaning into the idea that it's a video game you're not fishing. And that comes up a lot online. That really does about this idea that it's a video game, it's not fishing. It's a video game, it's not fishing. And I guess my first question is to all the, the people up there that are a little bit older is, 
what is the hatred of video games? Because that's what it really comes down to when you when your argument is that when it's set up that way, where it's like, well, it's just like a video game. Oh, th- these kids today and their video games. Why do you hate video games? Why why are you using that as the example? Because that comes with a negative connotation that it's like this, which you hate, which is very interesting to me. Because if the idea is that you're looking at a screen all day, well, there were other types of fishing where that was done. Was it to the degree? 100% I agree with you. It's not done to the degree. But why is there such a negative connotation with video games? Because what that also tells me is that there's a generational issue there. There is a big generational issue when you start saying, oh, it's just like a video game. And you see that in the comment section, which I screenshot some beautiful comments from across the internet that we're going to be looking at here. But anyway, we got our first caller here. Uh, we got, I mean, hope she gets on there. There we go. 973-907. Hi, boss. You're on Fishing the DMV. Hey, how you doing, Tom? This is Shane Clint. Hey, Shane. How you doing? I'm doing well. So I'm just out here on my boat taking off my forward facing sonar right now. <laughs> so I'm just getting ready. <laughs> so what's, what's interesting to me, Thomas, you know, you, you brought up a good point just now about the generational gap and you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm fixed turn 53 years old and I fish with forward facing sonar and I'm into technology, right? Um, that's the work, the line of work that I'm in, but I've also seen a lot of comments about you know this now that's going to be the old man's league the fpl is going to be the the old man fishing league because the older generation that are not wanting that are begging for this to be to be uh to be banned but you know i just throw out there okay if, if it's not an arms race if you don't want fishing to be an arms race then why aren't we limiting gear ratios on reels we can go off we can go off on all kinds of deep ends on you're not going to you know trying to limit bass fishing but the reality is you know the consumer drives the the the, you know the buying power for the fishing industry right so if if the consumer is going to continue to buy live scope and i agree with you i think next year that league will get better watches but i think the following year you'll see it tail down Mm -hmm. because when it push comes to shove people want to see fishermen catch big bass when they watch tv right yeah and if they're not producing the same bag limits in that league as you're getting in the BAS or with the, with the, the leagues that have forward facing sonar, it'll be, it'll be short lived. Yeah. And in I, my opinion. I, I agree. I agree with you a hundred percent. And I love the baseball analogies because I think people forget too, that baseball's viewing numbers went down after the steroid era because people liked seeing the long ball. Yes. 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 I, I yeah, they did. Um, it's been the same thing in fishing, right? It's the, you know, the home run of the grand slam when you get that 30 pound bag or 40 pound bag in a tournament is that's what people want to see. Um, so, I mean, I you know, teach their own, right? I mean, if you don't, if you don't like forward facing sonar, don't buy it. Um, is it an advantage sometimes, but you and I both know mm-hmm. just because you see the fish, you don't always catch the fish. Something that's interesting to me is how this evolved into the sports ethical question of how much technology do we allow to people online shaming you if you catch a fish using forward-facing sonar. It's insane how much this has unraveled in such a short period of time. I agree. I mean, you and I talked before about the power of social media and fishing. I think this is a great example of how this is kind of piled on as well. Do, do you think this is something that will cool? Like, how do you, how do we get out of this in your opinion? I think, I think how we get out of this is if this league is successful, um, and people gravitate to it, um, then you'll probably see the other tournaments or the other series move to it. But I, I think if it does, if it's not successful, um, I think you'll see it move back, and then the the, the chapter will be closed, right? Mm-hmm. We tried it. No one liked it, and the, the, we'll move on. But, you know, you and I both know the electronic companies, the, the Garmin's, the Lawrence's, they're going to keep pushing forward technology. Oh, yeah. They are. That's what they do. That's how they make money. And we're going to, you know, us average fishermen who aren't running around in our $150,000 bass boats, we're going to benefit from it. Um. And you know if they don't want to, if the if the leagues don't want to move with technology, then I think they'll die a slow death because then the fishing population will be ahead of the fishing uh, tournaments. 
the tournament anglers. I agree with you. Slowly but surely, if they if they keep being, yeah, it, it, it's interesting where we look at this. Where and I, I think it's something. It, I, sadly, I hated it to become this argument, but when I started to look into video game statistics and 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 the generations and and the age groups that adopt technology, you start seeing very. Uh, interesting parallels between what we're going through now and there's this slam yep. on younger anglers and how they do this but as as an individual that's on the board for Maryland and we talked about fishing license sales and they're down and stuff it, it, it's as a business what I'm so intrigued when they're making these decisions is why are you kowtowing to such a, a vocal potentially minority of your business that of your customer base when Okay, how much longer will we have this generation buying product versus the McKinney's, the 22 year olds, the 18 year olds? Like, I, I, I don't know. I'm confused by their right. business decision. Yeah, I, I am too. And, you know, one of the guys there said the guy's a marketing genius with, MP, you know, with this league. I'm like, well, I hope he's really, really, really good because mm -hmm. it's going to take, I think that, like I said, it's the first year you'll get some watches on it, but. You know, if they're not competitive with the other leagues, it's it's gonna he's gonna have to be more than a marketing genius. Yeah, to, no, to keep that league alive without using the talk technology. Yeah, no, I agree. So, and and then and, you know, I, I think it's. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no I said you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I lost my thought. You you finish up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I think this is this will satisfy a group of anglers, a professional anglers that have been frustrated with not being able to adapt to a technology. And so they raise their hand or, you know, and we know there are a few that just don't like it at all. But I think at the end of the day, um, it will probably be short lived because we know that the electronics companies drive a lot of money, drive a ton of money into bass fishing. They do. And they're, they're, they can't live without those funds and those sponsorships. I agree. And I think what's going to be interesting and for everyone to watch again, if you guys want to call in, I'd love to hear your opinion. It's 667-307-8583. We're getting a couple of callers in now, but I'll make sure to get it through everybody. I don't think they're going to stop with this because once you're like, okay, congratulations, we're going to give you a league, no four facing sonar. The next thing that they're going to push is, yeah, but it's not my league. Now I want every league to do this because the people that are ingrained in major league fishing or bass they're not going to just give up their membership and move over to the MPFL. I, I think they're going to then demand it on theirs. And I think that's what I'm afraid of is they're going to keep pushing the bar until it becomes totally eliminated. We'll see. I, I can't, I can't argue against it, but I, yeah. you will see a few of the folks in the other leagues. You will, but you know, we'll see how they react. That's all we can do is kind of watch, but I, Hey, I'm good with it. If if that's what if that's what uh, you know the bass tournament industry wants to do, because I'm not in that. Right, mm -hmm. I'm just a local fisherman, local YouTuber, and I'm going to take advantage of all the technology, all the best reels, all the best you know electric motors, etc. I'm going to take advantage of it because I like to catch fish, and whatever is going to help me catch fish, I'm going to I'm going to utilize. Yeah, and that's the thing is like it's fun. Catching fish is fun, and, and it really does give yeah. you that ability to year round chase whatever kind of game fish that you want to chase. Um, Sh Shane, I know i got a bunch of callers here, yep. but I want you to plug. Uh, you have a live yep. stream tomorrow night, correct? I do have a live stream, 8.30 tomorrow night. Uh, it's our tournament update for our smallmouth-only tournament. So dial on in if you would like to on YouTube or Facebook. There you go, guys. He runs one of the best online tournament organizations in the world. Go check it out, Shane Flint Outdoors. Sir, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yep, have a good one, Thomas. Thanks, Thanks boss. All righty, we got a couple more callers We're lining up here. All right, cool. So before I get to the other callers, we got six six seven three zero seven eight five eight three. Come on, give me a call in. Let's talk about this. I want to hear some opinions here. I mean, there's got to be some people out there that probably are completely like are 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 really excited that there is no forward facing sonar. You know, please feel free, call on in right now and let's talk about it. I'd love to get somebody else's perspective here on forward facing sonar, not just one side of the aisle here. I promise I will behave. I just truly want to get this conversation and this dialogue going. Uh, before we get to any more callers here, I want to get to some questions here. Uh, I got Everett saying, do you think with the band there will be a drop in weight? 
that is the uh, dude that is that is the million dollar question there i think it'll be interesting to see what happens with the weights because okay like let's think about this here door number one tomorrow night forward facing sonar is gone boom poof next year the weights don't change one argument could be made. What was the point in all the bitching and moaning if the weights basically stayed the same? Flip it around. You know, you it disappears. The weights go down by 10%, 15%. And it'll probably be on the top end, if I'm not mistaken. It'll probably be the top end weights that go down the most. Is that good for the sport? You know, regardless, I'm just saying, like, like if Bassmaster says big bass, big dreams, should they change their logo if it's not about actually catching the most weight? Like, and again, I think if the weights fall, it'll be in the one, like, the again, it's like a pyramid, right? It'll be like the top percent that they fall. And I do think it also depends on, like, where, where are we talking about? Like, are we talking about Lake Fork in February? Well, the weights will fall a little bit more. Do we think um, the St. Lawrence River? Weights will probably fall a little bit. Are we talking the Potomac River? I don't think the Sabine. <laughs> like, I think it's a case. But this is the this is the other thing that I think we've talked about in the show before a bunch is the fact that it's not just about forward facing sonar. But where are you implementing this sucker? You know, if you're in a clear canyon reservoir, Lake Mead, it's going to play a lot more than if it's Lake Okeechobee. Again, Grant is Martin one doing it, but I'm not saying it was it, that was all that he was doing and all the top 10 was doing there. So I think that is fascinating. Like no one will talk about the fact that you keep going to lakes that are devoid of vegetation because the homeowners associations like the one at Lake Gunnersville are trying to get rid of every blade of grass in Lake Gunnersville. Let's see how that place fishes in 10 years, folks. Well, what do you think you're going to be doing? You're going to have to use FFS to have consistent bites, to have consistent weights, those higher weights. Now, granted, again, can you do that 100%? Are you going to have the weights? Yeah. And then I guess that's the, isn't that the question that we're actually coming to a conclusion about right here? Is the fact, is it about the weights? How important is it to have weight, to have these massive bags? Would you rather watch a Pittsburgh tournament? And maybe that's too much of an extreme, and I apologize, but the Battle of Three Rivers... I thought it was cool as hell because I live on some shitty fisheries. So it's kind of like, hey, yeah, I get a taste of this. I don't live on Gunnersville or, or Toledo Bend. So it's fun. You come up here and you catch a two pounder. And you're like, that's my kicker. So maybe that's cathartic for me, I guess. But it still was fun to watch. Would I want every event like that? No. Do I think every event would become like that? Probably not. But even when we think about like with technology and how it evolves, I mean, let's. that's what's so fascinating to me is Again, like when Kevin Van Dam went on that massive tear in the early 2000s, you had inter external GPS units, you had side scan, you had better mapping, and then you had this thing called the you know 6XD that came out in the market here. But anyway, I want to get to some calls, guys. Uh, what we're going to be doing, guys, I'm going to be giving away some gift cards too. If you guys want to get on hold, uh, longer you're on hold for phone calls, I'll just I'll really increase that gift card for you. Let's see who we got here. Our next caller is 732. Here we go. 732-735. Uh, You're calling into Fishing the DMV. How are you doing, boss? Good. Name's Jason. Hey, Jason. Good to have you, you on doing, the show. Man? All right. So I guess I'm going to throw my two cents in. Um, kind of backpedaling. You guys are talking about the viewership in baseball during the steroid era. Yes. I think it was an alluring thing for people to watch because they were like wow these human beings are doing amazing things and uh you know a great statistic i think in the early 2000s we had 10 guys with over 50 home runs which was astounding you know you, you never saw that before um then it comes out it was all induced through steroids. Mm -hmm. so i think a lot of guys lost the interest in it people who weren't legitimate baseball fans stopped watching because oh those guys were just using performance enhancing drugs so when fishermen get upset saying that the weights are gonna drop well again you're talking the top level bass fishing pros we want to see who's the best at catching them and I don't know about uh, most guys out there but watching the guys on forward facing sonar versus watching Mid-2000s Van Dam cranking, like, 
it, uh, you literally watch lives now, and guys are standing there holding their rods and just scanning. It's boring for the watcher. So to make guys actually go out and fish, I think I think a lot of fishermen enjoy that aspect of the game. Sure, we enjoy seeing big bass caught, but you know when Craig Hackney flips a lay down and pulls a seven pounder out, like that's exciting. Um, so again, I, my I stand on. I think it's a good thing for the sport of bass fishing. It's an interesting uh, thing, too, with the bro, steroid era is the fact that it almost did the inverse of technology where the steroid era helped, like, lengthen c- people's careers, veterans' careers, but it almost feels like this technology is doing the adverse effect in fishing where it potentially could be stunning people's careers. Stunning uh, guys who are legitimate pattern fishermen. That no, it was, there's a tough fight, the little adjustments to make. Uh those days are gone. Like someone can be proficient with the live sonar, and it doesn't matter if there's a cold front or something changed, because he can literally just go down and scan around till he finds something to throw at. And I don't think the game at the professional level should be played like that. Now, if you want to go out because catching fish is fun and use it, that's awesome. That's great. It allows guys to do that that don't understand little nuances in bass fishing, uh, little adjustments to make. Um, I was going to go on to the umbrella rig. The reason why they banned the umbrella rig is because every tournament turned into everybody throwing the umbrella rig. It's, so it was like you're watching the same guys doing the same. It's, I'm, I'm curtailing to the, my point. That's what you're seeing now for forward face sonar. Ninety percent of the guys on TV are all doing the same thing. There's nothing, you know what I mean? Like you get a couple outliers here and there, but for the most part, every tournament is a jig head minnow and a guy taking live. So you know what I mean? Like, as a think- viewer, is that the it- most frustrating part? Is having everybody kind of doing the same thing? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 to me, I grew up watching a different kind of bass fishing. I don't know if someone just got into it or whatever the case is. Um, I grew up, you would have a Kevin Van Dam cranking mm. or uh, a Greg Hackney flipping and, you know, it, or, or uh, a Dean Rojas frogging or, you know, but now you don't, you don't get that in the national tournaments and i think it's a good thing because now you'll see guys have to turn and learn how to do different things and and, uh, attack bodies of water differently then i'm just gonna you know tie on five or six different jig heads and different minnows and uh see which one they react to uh i'm all for it i i think it's a good thing i think viewership should uh come back a little bit because again me i've uh, bass fished my whole life i've watched professional bass fishing since it's you know i mean i grew up watching rolling and and, and bill dance and i feel like all the stuff that those guys talked about is kind of thrown out the window once this technology's you know pattern seasonal change uh you know different kind of forages and and you know it's just it it, it all doesn't matter if you put that thing down in the water and you just go until you find them. Uh, so I think it, it's good at the highest level. We want to see the best fisherman in the world, right? Not the guy who's most proficient at understanding how powerful the technology he is using is, if that makes sense. Would you be, what would your thoughts be if we did have, sort of speak, a, well, like what crappie fishing does, where you have two distinct leagues? Let's just say, uh, well, MPFL, I love you. We're say you don't exist right now. Let's just say it's like basically FLW. We're going to have you do scope, use whatever the hell you want, and then bass old school. Would that be okay? Have two different leagues. Both are on TV. Just watch whatever you want to watch. Um, I mean, sure. I wouldn't personally care to tune into the, I may watch the highlights. 
<laughs> you know, mm-hmm. of, of of the of the scoping tournament. But I can't. You cannot tell me that you personally have watched the uh, the, the the professional level of fishing of recent and haven't had that thought. Like this is just like, come on, you know. It's like because it, it, every guy's doing the same thing, the same thing, same thing, same thing, and. So, yeah, I would probably watch the highlights of it, but to watch the live version of the, the Scopers League, I don't think I would tune in, man. I really don't. Yeah, and that's where I um, think that would be best is just open up both restaurants, so to speak, and just if you if you want your chicken, go here. If you want your cheeseburger, just go here and be done with it. And then we'll like, because I know that some people, yeah, yeah, it's a steroid era. You know what, dude? If you want to just put Trent in your body and grow a second head, good for you. I'll go watch you hit a ball 400 feet, but I'll also watch the other thing too. And I think there's clearly viewers for both. And I think the problem is we're all trying to live in the same house right now. And I don't think that's, I don't think it's going to happen. Right. <laughs> I really don't think it's going to happen. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole steroid thing, like you look now, man, uh, now it's back to normal again, right? Human beings are, are, you know, you have one or two guys that are hitting 50 mm-hmm. home runs, not 10 guys. So, like, uh, do I think maybe the weights would possibly drop? Of course, on certain bodies of water, absolutely. You may see the top bass anglers struggle to catch them without it, but we're still going to see a winner, someone who literally figured out how to put the fish in the boat better than the rest of the field. And that, to me is more alluring than the use of the technology to help do it. I, I you know, if that makes sense, because it's, it's a different form. Like, guys are like, oh, you have side imaging, 360, you have all that. It's great, but you still have to really pattern and figure out how to get them in the boat, as well as you do with the forward facing. But a part of the game is finding the fish. No. Um, no, a hundred percent, dude. Dude, I I have about eight people on the line right now, so I really apologize, but I really appreciate you calling in with with your no, perspective. No, 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 it's all good, brother. But uh, sir, thank you so I much. You, man. And uh, yeah, message me uh, Instagram or email me. I'm gonna get you a gift card um, just for calling in. I really appreciate this this call. This was good stuff. All right, man. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. All right, we got a couple more callers here on the line that we're All gonna right. get to. Um, it that was a that was a good call. That was a really good call. Love to get both sides of it here, and that's what I think. Again, I just we're gonna need two separate leagues. We are because I think people will watch. People will watch the forward facing sonar stuff, and people will watch without it. Um, there are some interesting things here, which I think this is an episode I have to do. Uh, Eric talks about this too, which is the viewership was up for bass this year. I would, I, I'm going to do a show about that. Let me gather the stats. If I can find them for bass, major league fishing and the MPFL to go through them to see if there's a spike. Cause I do know for a couple of the, the, the tournaments, they were bragging about their viewership. So I really want to actually look at that, but we got another caller here. I want to get to, uh, let's go, uh, six, six, seven, three, zero, seven, eight, five, eight, three. Again, call on in, uh, and we will get your opinions on it. So the next number here is nine, one, nine, three, four, two, uh, caller, you are on the line fishing the DMV. Hey, how's it going? Hey, what's up boss? Uh, nothing much. Michael Burr, uh, just wanted, if I could touch on a couple of points locally and, uh, nationally, about this i've never called into a podcast before but i'm a piedmont and shenandoah angler and both in the top 20 in points and i've won with uh before facing forward facing so- sonar and, and uh and i've won after forward facing sonar and uh you know the first point to touch base on your last caller i think uh electronic companies and live coverage has failed us as tournament anglers on showing what forward facing sonar really is and the applications they've given us five minutes of thank you live coverage a sneak peek and it was, and it was all mega live it was garbage that they had no money behind those anglers and no explanation whatsoever what was going on allow allow you to elaborate on your thoughts on that one no that's that's a big one there's i've always wondered that where it's the job of a production company to cut to action and so before forward-facing sonar, 
Mark Zona and Tommy Sanders are the two legends. They were doing a great job of, of being able to cut quick because again, spoilers for people that are listening. It's never actually live. There's a delay. There's a lag. So they can try to jump to the boat that has action. Right. How much is that color? the view of forward facing center because you always cut to the person and oh my goodness they just dangled that minnow and they caught one it's crazy well that's because of the movie magic there where of course they're going to cut to the guy that caught one not the guy that stood there for six hours not doing shit so how much does that also play into it oh uh quite a bit but people want to see fish catches yep. you know what i'm saying and that's where the disconnect in my opinion between tournament anglers and viewers is and that's where the social media conundrum comes into play is that if you vet even, you know, unnamed people that are really anti forward facing sonar, we all know who they are. Most of those people aren't fishermen or leisurely pond fishermen. They have nothing to do with the tournament scene. They don't understand the technology and something in their mind is telling them, oh, this is wrong and this is not traditional. But they haven't spent the last five years of their life, like I am every time I'm on the water trying to beat a Tyler Trent or, you know, <laughs> Eric Hudson yeah. or all these guys that are at the top of the game, you know, uh, last year, you know, three places behind them, less than a pound. You know what I'm saying? That's my new goal. You know, I've won without it, but it's not luck anymore. You know what I'm saying? Still the same guys are producing the same checks. If you look at the standings in Virginia and North Carolina, especially, I can speak for that, but I've fished the Toyota series I've fished all around this country. And, you know, the, the biggest thing that I see, like, people say Alec Morrison and all these young guys can't catch it without it. I knew Alec Morrison when he was 11 years old. Knew his mom fished with, you know, uh, <laughs> he had the two best mentors, and Carl Jackson took him under his wing for seven years. That kid was on the boat with him going through those struggles. And he can catch them without forward-facing sonar, trust me. And that's so insulting to those young guys the Kyle Patricks and the Ben Millikens and all those guys, they were crushing them. They'll win any tournament. And <clears throat> that's what really angers me about this whole argument is like, you got the non tournament people against the tournament people and they have no idea what they're talking about. Dude. I, yeah, I mean, I a hundred, a hundred percent agree with that there. And let me, uh, I actually want to guys, I'm going to show you something. This was another, project i'm working on here but you know i'm going to give you a, a little quick glimpse of this because these are the these are the most comments i found online uh when when you put it through the old algorithm and i think it's really interesting so i'm going to share my screen right here here are some comments that came up the most uh these kids and their forward-facing sonar are ruining the sport here is a couple of fantastic comments uh take forward-facing sonar away and most of these kids will quit and head back to their basement another comment is this young generation of guys uh will have to quit if they do away with all this forward-facing sonar the amount of comments online on all social media about video games and the young kids and forward-facing sonar, I don't need to know the names and profile pictures to get a picture of, of these individuals. <laughs> and it's so interesting, this war on, like, again, it's like, I get, I don't understand like why they hate video games so much. That's a one argument. It's like, cause you're saying that like you hate that, but also it's like, I hate young kids and their, and their rock and roll. That's what it sounds like. And if you <laughs> piss off this young generation, you won't have anglers. They'll go do something else. And I don't understand this cutting your nose off to spite yeah. your face thing. Uh, I, I don't either. But you know what? We're headed down a troubling road, I think, in, in general. When anybody bans something, it's never good. Limitations is always or, or you know, angler input and really doing the research. And I hope no other league jumps to conclusions because I'm really worried about that you know, the BFLs and the Toyota series, because, you know, all this no angler participation, the economy is garbage, man. Yep. You know what I'm saying? It's getting harder and harder. I'm fishing two divisions and going broke. I'm not a rich guy. I'm an electrician. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's everything that I can do to, you know, have a traveling co-angler and help me share those expenses. And I can appreciate that. But you know what? Participation's down because it's getting more and more expensive and the payouts have not been there for years. You know, that's another argument. Why is it these narratives pop up where they don't talk about the fact that payouts suck? They don't talk about the fact that more and more organizations like CAT and ABA do just solo events where you don't have to deal with a co-angler. Like, we're not going to talk about those arguments and those conversations. It's just forward-facing sonar versus the co-angler go. Those are That's all you hear about and none of these other factors. The yeah. economy, it, it, that's interesting to me. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I look at it, you know, we never fished for big money, you know what I'm saying, or or fortune and glory. I, I fished my first tournament in Mississippi State at Columbus Pool, uh, the red man and still had the plaques, the first ter- tournament that I won. And, and, uh, it, my club was at the motor guide plant down there and I was 19 years old and, you know, it old school. And, and, you know, to see where it's evolved in today, um, you know, I just think it was affordable back then, man. You know what I'm saying? Things were just not out of control when you're buying $20 crankbaits or, and, and the gas to get to these tournaments. And then the co-angler is not required to give you gas money. And that's a different conversation. Um, you know what I'm saying? That, you know, th- this week I'm leaving and fishing the chick. I, you know what I'm saying? I have a 160 mile round trip. I'm going to burn 400 and something dollars worth of gas in my boat and I'm going to get 20 or 40 bucks. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? I mean, it doesn't matter about a co angler. You know what I'm saying? We all know it's just, uh, I think that, you know, this whole forward facing sonar dilemma. Social media has driven it to be such a bad thing, and I think it's such a good thing. I have learned more yeah. in the past five years about fish behavior and why I was catching fish out where, you know, I would see a rock pile, but now I can see why that they were there, what time of year they were there, you know, and, and it taught me, and, and, and like I said, I get better and better and better. Take it away. I'm just going to go practice that, and everybody is too. You take it away, say at BFL, I'm going to go practice the weekend before. There's no official practice period, right? I'm going to go mark all my structure. I'm going to go back to my point one, lining it up, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm going to fish the same stuff. I just can't catch the suspended fish. Is that is that any which way unfair to a co angler that I'm going to fish the same areas or, or the same way? I mean, you know, I, I mean, Table Rock would be the only exception. I understand why those uh, divisions may be suffering, but for the 99 percent of the, uh, you know, the other divisions, in my opinion, I mean, a, a co angler cashes a check almost every time or gets a trophy that they fish with me because I'm around fish. If you're not around fish, forward fo- sonar. Uh, doesn't matter a thing. <laughs> and, and I so also just wonder. my opinion about that. I just keep wondering. It's like, how much is the, the co-angler just an outdated relic of a different time? And, and again, it's not saying I, I would force it to go away, but more and more leagues are just saying like, hey, listen, like I see these, I, this happened at High Rock. I had a bunch of friends, like there wasn't enough co-anglers. And so I paid boater money, sure. but I had to do a boater on boater I draw. Had a boat on boat, I had a boat on boat. I had a boat. I had one of those boat on boat draws and it had a, had a, and I, voluntarily because the kid i wasn't fishing the north carolina division and i had a 20 something year old uh young guy and with a smaller boat than mine and i hopped on with him i spent i was up to 1 30 in the morning grabbing my stuff off and i gave him and we had a, a fantastic day and we caught and he uh he cashed a check and and we laughed and had a great time you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. i mean it was you know it, it sucked for what it was but uh you know we had no n- no problems doing it we're able to work. And now was I upset because I took two days off of work? Absolutely. But you know what I'm saying? We made it work. You know, that's what we've always done. Uh, yeah. And all this, yeah. you know, negative criticism and everything, you know. But that's an outdated. So. That's what I'm getting to is like, that's outdated. Like, boater on boater draw, do we really need that in 2025? Like, can we just be like. No, not, not with the computer. Al- yeah. Yeah, not with the computer algorithm and stuff that we have today. And MLF, you know, we're, we we know that certain organizations are greedy about they'll accept anybody up to the last minute, and it could be Bingo. very easily upon that two uh, upon that two week cutoff trawl. You either have a link or you don't. Everybody gets in the tournament, and then if your link drops off, you don't get to fish. And they have standbys. Then then bring the co anglers down. Have three or four on standby. And if someone gets sick or God knows that has to leave that morning, say you're more than welcome to come to the ramp. And if somebody drops out or doesn't show, you're, you're, you're able to fish. If, if Major League Fishing came out with a rule that like you just pay an extra, I don't know, 100 bucks, 120 bucks, you don't have to deal with a co-angler, you just have to have a camera going. Do you think anybody would jump on that? No, because we saw the price wars back when, when they sold – uh, you know, when FLW just sold to, uh, you know, that was the same hate we had now. Don't you agree? Uh, it went up to 300 bucks and I, I was, I was thinking about dropping off because they rated the no payouts and to get the numbers up before they sold it. That was just as bad amongst tournament anglers, not the social media aspect because no one ever cared and it wasn't advertised. Right. So we've been through that. Where do you think the payouts are going? <laughs> do you think it's just going to the MLF or the PPT? 
<clears throat> yeah, they're, you know, they collect 32.3% of every tournament. You could do the math, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's very expensive and, you know, I would have rather have side pots myself is the way to handle this, you know what I'm saying? And, and team trails have been doing it, Texas team trails, all that. Hey, I don't mind paying my, you know, 225 for the regular MLF makes their money. They send people, they got to employ people and everything else. But what about a 50 or a hundred dollar side pot for the first, you know, three to five places when you win, you cover your expenses, you make a little bit of money, you know, uh, when you're in the top five, I, I don't like win at all. Like, you know what I'm saying? I wish they paid down the field farther I, regional to make your money. I a hundred percent agree with this because I think this is a whole other show topic, but when it's just, the first guy yeah. actually makes all the money because that's not a real sport. It's just, it's habitual gambling. I would love it to where the first paycheck is yeah. double your entry fee or something like that to where, yeah, there's so many guys that have never cracked a win, but are always in the top 10, top 15. And you can't survive doing that. And that's, sure. that's disgusting. Right. On the BFL level or the professional yeah. level. And that's why they're going so broke. $10,000, you know, people are, oh, they, they make $10,000. But, you know, Justin Atkins and all those, you know, friends of mine, okay, they'll tell you they spend seven or $8,000. And if it wasn't for sponsorship money, they're making making maybe $1,000 or something from that 10000 mm. Nobody's showing that dark side of the industry. No, you no. know what I'm saying? And, and you know, think of, you know the, the expense, the travel, the bait, the, you know, the electronics. The boat payments, you know, everybody assumes that pros get free boats and all this stuff. Man, they're hanging. It is the dream for a reason, right? But most of them go broke and you never hear their stories. You know, the Derek Hudnalls and all that stuff that, you know, uh, they had, uh, they did good for a while. And then when it goes bad, it goes bad. And then they were bankrupt and you never hear from them again. And they, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's the sad thing about it, if we're going to call ourselves a sport. And, you know, Milliken touched a little bit about it, yeah. but the industry wants nothing to do with that dark side of the industry. And that's where we're not a sport until that's addressed. And, you know, I'm worried about, you know, I'm not interested in, there was a time that I was interested at the top level, but thank God I didn't pursue it because, you know, now that I know a lot of people and are in touch with those, those guys, I, w I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole. I'd rather go put black on, you know, in mm. Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> the road, that's, and if bass doesn't get their shit together, the kayaking industry and all these other things are just going to eat their lunch because it's just so much cheaper and your return on investment. I mean, yep. like it, Irwin Miner yep. went up to the St. Lawrence, double dip for two terms because you can do that. And I think he won like twelve or fifteen thousand dollars for a three hundred down payment. Like Jesus, like it, it's it's Isn't that crazy? it's a crazy because like and the fact that you can enter like three tournaments and go out there and fish at the same time. Like I'm telling you, I tr I'm dabbling more and more in it because it's like I can I don't die with petrol payments to fill up my boat and fish the Potomac is a goddamn nightmare, <laughs> but I can go out in a kayak, charge up the torpedo battery and okay, you know, I can, I won't bleed to death. It, it's just, yeah, it's insane. Like I do think about, like I have, I've had, like, I had Chris Berman on this show talking about long runs and off the air. I was like, the problem is, do I, is it actually financially worth to make that long run? Legitimately, if I spend a thousand dollars in petrol, drive down there to win a thousand bucks, like it doesn't sometimes make sense. <laughs> well, you know, but, hey, when we launch out of Osborne Landing, you know what I'm saying, yeah. and we run down the check, you know what I'm saying, it's 81 miles one way, and mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, you got breakdowns, you got and, and and all that stuff to worry about. I have, you know. My buddy with a, a set of keys for my truck, he can meet me down. I got Bo -to -u or, uh, Towboat USA. You know what I'm saying? You got to have it if you fish anywhere up north, Lake Erie, Champlain. What, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's another added expense. But, you know, like the long runs, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I have no other choice. The tide's right. You know what I'm saying? For this weekend, I've got to go. You know what I'm saying? Because I only need to catch a fish to, to make the regional and the super tournament. But to make money, if I don't make that run, I'm not I'm not putting myself in contention. You know what I'm saying? And and like I, it brings us back is, you know, are we in it for the the love of the sport? Absolutely. Everybody that fishes BFLs is in love of the sport. It's been the same guys. We've traded money for 15 years in North Carolina that I've been here. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We don't do it for the money. We, we you know we, we do it for you know let's see who's the best this year, right?
Boss, it comes down to it. I really appreciate you uh, you calling in. Uh, I'm going to get to some uh, other callers. Good luck this weekend out on the James River. I'll be rooting for you. Appreciate it, man. Be safe. Doctor. Thanks, man. See you. All righty, guys. We got. I'm going to make sure I know. I got so backlog here with callers. Again, 667-307-8583 is the number. We got another caller here. We got 540-830. Again, the number is 540-830. How are you doing tonight? You're on Fishing the DMV. We got another caller here. We got 540-830. Again, the number is 540-830. How are you doing tonight? You're on Fishing the DMV. Hey, how are you doing, Thomas? Hey, how are you doing, boss? All right. Hey, this is Paul. Ricky. Hey, uh, I've just been watching. Yeah. Yeah, I've been just watching the show, and, you know, I four face sonar, and I fish without it on most of my tidal waters. So, um, what I'm hearing and what I have talked to some of my local guys or and the guys that I run with in the opens is – you know, some are for it, some aren't. But what what I see is, you know, like one guy was talking earlier, um, you know, the basic concepts of getting back to uh, fishing in general. You know, pattern fish, uh, when cold fronts come in, when to move, you know, tournaments are being won, you know, on – you know, 10 to 20 different baits. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's what I'm seeing. You know, I think, you know, I, I ask people, you know, about, okay, if you have a, a Gerald Swindle here and you have a, have a Trey McKinney over here, how, what line is going to be bigger to get an autograph? A Gerald Swindle here. It, so it's an you know, interesting thought process there because is McKinney going to be the next Gerald Swindle though in ten to fifteen years? You think like or not just McKinney, but I'm using him as a as a template for any young angler. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you know I I fished with them guys two years ago in the opens, you know, and and all them boys can fish, and you know, or they wouldn't be where they're at. But you know, I think. Um, you know, it's like the one guy was saying, you know, just got off the phone with, you know, I don't fish MLF. Um, my reason being is, you know, I think a lot of the money goes to the BBT. Um, I had a friend fish Smith finished second and he got $1,400. You know, I, I fish Mississippi and won Ross Barnett. It was 225 anglers, and I won $23,686. Wow. That's so, insane. Wow, that's crazy, dude. You know, yeah. Oh, I know. And it's, you know, I just think, you know, I think what you're going to see with the MPFL, you'll probably see it go away for a year or two. But I think what you're going to see is you're going to see some of the bigger names in bass will probably move over and fish the MPFL, but they're also going to fish bass, too. And, you know, because you're going to, you're going to see next year, there's more guys coming back to bass because I think it's everybody wants to go to the Classic. That is interesting to think about, like, all that and the Classic and, and how bass is going to react to this. Um Ricky, because uh, we've got like about five other people lined up for calls. I want to make sure I get through everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Um, we definitely got to get you back on the show sometime in the future. Yeah. All righty, bud. No problem. I just wanted to put in my two cents. All right. Love you, boss. Talk to you later. All righty. All right. Bye bye. All right, guys. Uh, again, then number is 667-307-8583. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, going forward, Chris, I see what you're saying there. I'll make sure I uh, – yeah, sometimes I'm just too terribly polite. It's my it's my uh, 
homeschool upbringing. Uh, if you call in, turn off your YouTube audio so we don't have the echo, just a friendly public service announcement. Yeah, I got to get a little bit more lambastic. Let's get to some comments here before I get to any more uh, call-ins because I know we had a bunch of people, uh, a couple people dropped off there. I'm sorry, I had a couple people on there for about 10 minute wait hold time. Uh, please call in again and I will make sure I bumped you to the front of the line. I did screenshot your phone number so I know who you are. So if you'd like to call back in again, I'm sorry that you were waiting for so long there. Uh, if you are on Instagram, Todd, Langford, I see you. I can't share your comments on Instagram because Instagram and StreamYard does not work because it is very stupid. So I'll just read out those comments and I'll get to some of the uh, old Super Chat questions too. Langford said, my Fountainhead partner from back in the day fishes Facebook Live Redfish events. They're very popular. I think that would be freaking awesome, by the way, because if you think about it, you have redfish and speckled trout fishing right now is absolutely the best it's ever been in the Chesapeake Bay. And I think ki inshore kayak fishing and inshore fishing in general is about to pop off. I think our kids and our grandkids are going to have the coolest fishery ever in the history of forever because you're going to have tarpon. Yes, tarpon in the Chesapeake Bay. You're going to have the redfish population, the speckled trout population. You have the sheep's head. It, it's just going to be an insanely cool fishery here in the next 10 years as it keeps growing. Um, then we have, let's see, got the other one from Todd. Uh, he came in eighth in the national event. And then we have uh, David Milling Fishing. I had the honor of meeting this individual, uh, Dave Miller Fishing, with uh, the Bass Cast Radio with Brian. Brian, huge shout out there. Bass Geek, Brian and myself are the co hosts of that crazy show we will be doing another show tomorrow night they're pre-recorded i think they go up on old thursdays as well so let's get to some comments here before we get to some more phone calls i really like this this has been a good diverse people on the show talking about the pros the cons of it it's split and i don't think we're ever going to come back this is hey sometimes you marry the wrong woman and you just need a divorce and i think we just need two separate leagues uh, we've got eric saying Bassmaster needs to eliminate practice to show up on thursday for the tournament and go fishing the bank fishermen or forward facing sonar guys would start the tournament with no advantage over each other Bassmaster needs to switch the lakes they fish every year eric i 100 percent agree with that last statement i know how the belly of the beast works where it's the lakes that pay you but and this was brought up before where it's you know i miss watching guys flip or pitch or, or seth fighter with the frog on lake champlain but that means again i keep going back to it you need a place that has the pads to throw the frog you need a place that has laydowns there are some events that are just gonna suck from a viewer's perspective i think the saint lawrence in one sense, I could see where you think that's boring, where if you look out through the camera and it's just an ocean and you're going up and down in the waves, it's not as aesthetically pleasing. Lake Gunnersville, before they spray with all the herbicides and kill all the grass and your dog, you could throw a frog there and you could watch a frog bite. That's really cool. So there, there's so many things with that that you could do there. We got Chris again. Uh, oh, sorry, my bad. Wrong one. Here we got Frank again. Uh, I have heard rumors of the co-anglers being a big voice against forward facing sonar my statement to that is go buy a boat and go as an angler that is a hot one right there the co-angler versus uh co-angler versus boater thing uh we got a phone number here let me see we got another caller make sure i get through these callers so they don't stay on the line way too long here we got 919714 caller you're on fishing the dmv hey what's going on man this is uh my name is tyler golf Hey, Tyler. Just, uh, here to talk uh, talk about this Ford fishing thing. What do you think about this whole thing? Ah, uh, man. I don't know. You know, I'm I'm pretty torn on the the decision. But, you know, I got a buddy named Louis Minetti that uh, I agree with on the subject. He made an Instagram post earlier talking about the, you know, National Professional Fishing League separating themselves from Bass yeah. and MLF. As in, you know, they're the first. They're the first to do this. They're the first to separate themselves and actually ban it now whether or not banning it is the right decision i don't know um i i do agree with what he says in that note but i do personally think and i, I came up with an idea in my head the other day i was talking to some buddies about it and i was like man i really wish they would have just went in a direction with like instead of banning it outright just you know make it to where there's like intervals throughout the day where you could use it like 20, mm -hmm. 30 minute intervals throughout the day to add like another, add like another edge to the competition. You know, I feel like that would have been pretty cool, but obviously that's the way they decided to go with it. I guess we'll just have to wait and see what Bass and MLF are going to do. If I had a thought in my head and I want to get your opinion on it, that if major league fishing and bass at the end of next year, come out and say they're going to ban four facing sonar, 
I could easily see MPFL then pivoting and saying like, we're going to allow everything. Um, and I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. I think what they're talking about strategically is a very good business move right now. Be the first, get this, get the presence. You're going to make the big splash with all of your viewing and stuff because you're not going to have it. Um, and if they flip flop like that, I'm all for it because they're kind of trying to be the other side of the coin. And that's what we really need is this balance because for some reason, Bass and MLF are just having this weird identity crisis that they want to be each other. They can only be one with those two and it's infuriating. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you hundred percent on that one, man. It's, I don't think fishing's ever been in this situation before, you know, even with, the Alabama rig and everything else in between, you know, that's come from the past. I don't think fishing has ever been in the situation it's been in right now. And, you know, it's just, it's so crazy because, you know, you look back before pre live scope, how simple things were. And now all of a sudden live scope thrown in the mix and everything is just so chaotic. Now there's so many different opinions. It's very political. Um, you know, I personally am a fan of, you know, forward facing sonar. I like to use it a lot. I mean, it's definitely helped me learn, you know, a lot of different things about fishing, you know, like I love to fish before live scope, but I still love to fish after it. It just, you know, it just throws a little different curveball into it, but I, I definitely, I uh, I agree with you. And it's just the, yeah, it's, the it's, hate has ratcheted yeah. up to 11. That's what's insane to me. And, and may, maybe I'm just an innocent summer child, but it just felt like it went from zero to 60 real quick on basically if you like to throw forward facing sonar, well, you're basically a fascist. Like it's insane how we got here. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> that's, that's almost what it seems like. You know, it's, you know, this, you got the left, you got the right, you know, that it's kind of like that same thing where, you know, we're being divided right now by this technology. And, you know, really, I feel like it's something, you know, I feel like forward facing sonar, in my opinion, is something that will bring a lot of people into the sport, especially, you know, people that aren't, you know, familiar with fishing and, or want to get into fishing or people that, you know, are trying to learn. It kind of shortens that learning curve for sure on some of these people. Like, I definitely have a lot of fun taking family members out and, you know, being able to put them instantly on some fish just because of the fact that I know I have, you know, the live scope unit and I can easily find these fish and I can cut the, you know, the time and in, in half and finding these fish, you know, just for that aspect of it, you're not even tournament fishing, but just putting people on fish, you know, to get them into the sport. You know what I mean? And that's the thing too, is it's, you catch fish. It becomes a catching thing and not just a, in the moment. And I think it's really, it's, it's the process versus outcome. You know, a lot of these old school anglers are about, well, it's a process versus now it's like, well, now you have all this technology. It's the outcome of like, well, how many can you catch? And it's, it's just more fun to be out there, especially winter time. Like the last winter was my first time having scope throughout the winter. And I was out fishing so much more, not even just bass, but going out crappie fishing and stuff where if I didn't have forward facing sonar, there's no way in hell I would have been out there fishing. I, man, I can agree with you. I've, I've fished my ass off in the winter without it and I've had success, but I've also gone out there in the winter time and it really shows you what the fish's behavior are, whether they're bass or mm -hmm. crappie or, you know, whatever striper. You really learn a lot about their behavior in the wintertime, you know, going out there with these units and, and seeing how they react to your baits. I mean, because you'll be surprised at how aggressive some fish will be in some of the nastiest of weather because of forward facing sonar. And, I, you know, you can definitely learn from that. Um, it's, it's a crazy time, man. It really is, boss. And, and you know, dude, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, you want to give a shout out to any, anybody? Uh, I mean, I can shout out my YouTube channel if that's cool. Go for it. It's uh, TG Outdoors on YouTube. I live in the uh, Granville County area of North Carolina. I mainly fish Falls Lake, Jordan Lake, and Carr Lake. Um, I, I'm, that's where most of my footage and videos are, are based off of. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Right on. Thank you so much, guys. Go check on out his YouTube channel here. we got a couple more callers, and we're going to be getting to them here in a minute, dude. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for calling in. Um I also was going to save this for another show, but here's a great little comment that I found online under a Bassmaster video. Uh, Four facing sonar is the LGBTQ of the fishing world. Guys, what are we doing? Is this really what we're becoming fishing wise? Really? Are we having these arguments in fishing? Is politics and fishing now just going to be the same thing. This is insane. Some of these comments I'm starting to see. 
And I'm now getting a little worried because at first it was like, maybe we should, we should limit forward facing center. Maybe we should put some rules in. We are going to get to a point that if you take a picture of a bass and somebody sees a, a black box or a scope transducer on your boat, you will get, you will get publicly shamed for catching a fish, not in a tournament. I'm just saying, just going out and catching them. You will be publicly shamed. That's how bad it's getting. It is you versus them. It's the Redskins versus the Cowboys. This is where we're getting at. Republican versus Democrat. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we doing here? This is insane. Um, we got real angling is not watching a video screen. Uh, yeah, dude, uh, rock fishing buster call on in. I would really like to get you on the show to talk about this. The number is six, six, seven, three, Oh, seven, eight, five, eight, three. Uh, yeah. Call on in and uh, give us your thoughts here. Again, rocks thoughts are real angling is not watching a video screen. That is, yeah, that is a opinion that people have here. Now, I know some people have said in the past, we had them on the show talking about how, you know, it's not necessarily the best thing for professional fishing. We talked about the steroid era, but I don't think anyone said like, it's not real fishing. I don't think that's been made. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You know, I've been talking for a while here, so I could be completely off like that. Um, we got a couple more comments here I want to get to here. The bottom, we got Langford again. Let's see. The bottom line uh, is that without forward facing, you can't put the peanut right in front of the elephant. Todd, can that please be a shirt? Damn, that's a great. You can't put the peanut in front of the elephant. And it's just the data. It's the information too. Like you can just make decisions. There's less luck involved with forward-facing sonar. And is that a bad thing? And here's another great hypothetical here is I've heard this before. It's like it takes all the luck out of fishing. Well, if that's the case, is fishing just gambling? Because if you need more luck and fate in your sport, well, that's called the casino. All the sports out there have a small piece of luck, but most of it is skill. And so with more technology, the forward-facing sonar, it becomes more skill-based than luck in theory, correct? And if that's the case, what you're saying is you would prefer it not to be a sport. Going back is gambling technically because there is more luck in a hunch. That's all based on that. So just 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 a thought there. Uh, we got another caller here. We got Frank that says the argument about the young kids winning tournaments is BS. BMP won tournaments as a young kid well before forward facing. So absolutely, Frank. And you know what? He won. Um, well, he didn't win, but he kind of won like the Mississippi event. But then he like he called over state lines and got in trouble. But he was basically kicking everyone's ass in that event. And then later on in the year, I think it was the first time that he did that crazy St. Lawrence River run where he like drove was it like two and a half hours to get to his spot in the lake he got to fish for what two hours and then basically had to leave and come back and he won that event but he had to make a hell of a run that year that was that was crazy uh we got rockfish buster here uh because sooner or later the technology will take over and chip and and a chip bait will find the fish okay so rock again then again dude i would love to to have you call in and talk about this 667-307-8583 if you'd like to call in um are we not for self content not a contest uh, it's interesting because like i think we all agree with limitations like we could say just one screen you know one screen in the front one screen on the back one transducer something we can limit it that way that's fine then you talk about the baits like a chip that finds the fish i mean yeah i guess then the fish would have to open its mouth still otherwise it's snagging and that's illegal in new york state because i know like like you can't hook a fish on the outside of the mouth in new york in upstate new york so that's something that would be very interesting there as well yeah it's i don't think this will ever be i don't know how we fix this i really don't i just truly think in my heart we just need two separate leagues and what i'm terrified of is bass and major league fishing are going to jump on the bandwagon because it's safe. And this is the thing that really just pisses me off the most about bass in my life is they're just gutless and spineless and they have no morals and they don't give a shit. Look at what's happening at Lake Okeechobee. Look at what happened at the St. John's river. Look at what happens right now on Lake Gunnersville. Lake Gunnersville will be dead in five years. Lake Gunnersville will be dead because of all the spraying. The governor, I think was out there last week talking about what they're going to do. They're going to try to pest it. They're going to try to herbicide. I like to say pesticide for some reason. They're going to try to herbicide that whole lake until there's no grass left. If they had their way, that's what they're going to do. They're going to murder the lake. The lake will be dead. No one gives a shit. There's no protest from fishermen. There's no argument there, but let's do hashtag ban forward facing sonar. That's what's more important than our lakes. I had, I had Miller on the show, or he was on the BassCast radio last week. He talked about lakes up near him. Over 10 dogs died. Lakeshore dogs died 
because they sprayed so much herbicide to get rid of the grass that it killed people's pets. And that got swept under the rug by the people up there, the brass. Um, I wonder what will happen if that happened at Lake Anna. I wonder what that happened at Smith Mountain Lake or the Potomac River or hell, like say like, I don't know, what if your kid died from that? Pretty sure no one would actually complain, honestly. At this point, I truly don't think if a, a bunch of dogs died or pets, parents died, like, I don't think any of people would actually care, honestly. You'd just probably get swept under the rug. Um, but anyway, that's a whole other tangent from another show is getting into the aquatic vegetation. We got our next caller here is 804301. Caller, you are on Fishing the DMV. Hey, Thomas. Hey, how you doing? Uh, that's good. This is Bruce. Hey, Bruce. How you doing, boss? Uh, doing good. Hey, man, I, I think I applaud their decision for trying something different this year. I mean, even with banning it, it's not banned totally. Mm-hmm. They can use it in practice before the official practice. So they're still using it. They just can't use it during the competition days so they can still go out and look fine, do whatever. It's a, it's a win-win situation. I I agree. And I think the bigger, the only thing I would have a caveat is like, is it just, you have to take off your transducer because I would be in for that. If they want you to remove the black box and everything, that's where I feel like it could be a little bit of a hassle. But besides that, yeah, like you try something different and, and let's see, Let's see what happens. I mean, I just really hope Bass and MLF stay with forward-facing sonar so we can see a, a really stark comparison. Let's watch a live stream with it, and let's watch it without it, and then we can make a decision. Yeah. I, I don't see Bass Pro Tour changing anything. Uh, BFLs, eh, I don't know. They're still out on the line. They. Somebody said they took it back. They're not going to do, you know, ban it. So I don't know. Bass, I've heard, may do something with the screen size of total screen amount of screen space. Maybe something with transducers. So I don't see the outright ban. I see more of a limit on it, some of it. But uh, if you want to limit it, just go to places where you're going to throw up shallow. Agreed. I mean, agreed. Plain and simple. Yeah, like, I mean, mean, let's not be like kidding ourselves here. If you're going to go up to the Great Lakes or in February, you go down to some of these lakes, like it's going to be more of an offshore bite. Like, come on, just just structure your events when they're up in that late pre-spawn spawn spawn time frame or it's a grassy place like we can do this. Yeah, I agree. Let's go places where you're not going to use it because of the situations and then if you want to go up to um somewhere up north and do something for the small mouth that are out deep fine let them use it yeah because that, that's the interesting thing when it comes to the argument up north where back in the day where you'd throw out a drift sock and drag a tube when I watch that old footage, it's really hard for me to tell the difference between when they were scoping and dragging on the Great Lakes and dragging a tube with a drift sock because the scenery is the same like what they're just holding on for dear life because they're getting beat to death with the waves like i i ugh, I don't that argument i don't like as much but when you're talking about those other tournaments i agree we could make an argument there april at hartwell or something like that so go to the potomac river go to um okeechobee go to some of these places that have a shallow water bite or go during the spawn, like Smith Mountain Lake during the spawn. That place is always one with docks. Like, and again, guys, people are listening. I'm just using Smith as an example. There's a ton of places that have a great shallow water bite certain times of the year. Build the schedule that way, and that would limit it. Because yeah, if, if you go to some of these lakes where it will be, everyone knows how some of these places are going to be won. Everyone knows how the St. Lawrence is going to be won. There's no spoilers there with how that sucker is going to be won. So why is that always? The art, and maybe it's because it's the end of the year, and so that's the last thing that we talk about is that last event, and maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, and, and we know Scott Martin used it at Okeechobee in scout mode. Mm-hmm. He wasn't watching the fish actually eat because it's not as much detail in Scott scout mode. We know he used it to find certain things, like you know, a target that he wanted to throw to, but you know. You know they're not going to use live for that. 
and he's an outlier. I mean, if you look at a lot of the top 10, not everybody was doing that. What Scott did was very, very unique at the time. And again, I, I and just to get ahead of this, because this will be in the comment section, scout mode is basically a, a juiced up version of 360. I, I know some people are going to say they can see fish on it. You have to have really good eyes or a big ass screen to be able to really see those fish moving around there. But it's about cast angles, which is really what it's about. And I, and I agree with you there. Um, I, I mean... What do you think it's going to do weight-wise, in your opinion? Do you think the weights are going to go down, or do you think they're going to go up or stay the same next year? Well, it depends on where they go. If they're going somewhere where it's a shallow bite, no, I don't see them going down. But, like, if you go to, like, Fork or somewhere like that where they're going to be fishing offshore, mm-hmm. then, yeah, the weights are going to go down a little. Um no, we're not going to see those magic 30 pound bags, you know, and 500 century belt given out in that tournament. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it, it'll be interesting when they go to those weird, like Neely Henry in like late May, June, like where the bite will be tough. I think that'll tamp it down too. But I think those classical ones, like, um, like you said, like a Toledo Bend Lake Fork small adjustments in weight, but everyone is still going to catch them pretty good. And the St. Lawrence river will always be freakish. I just don't think, like you said, you're going to see all those century belts, but it's not like it's going to drop off the face of the earth. Um, I've got a really cool comment here too, is, uh, why is there no argument against wake boats? That was another thing about the grass and stuff. I dude, we are going to have somebody on to talk about the wake boat thing. Cause I do agree in some of these places, wake boats are an absolute problem. U S kayak fishing magazine, never heard of the NPFL before it is the third circuit boss. Uh, they're, they're up and coming. I really actually like how NPFL holds themselves and everything. They're, they're a really smart business in my, my belief. Um, Because they just do their own thing. They're not trying to, they are, and I see this in the best way possible, like Chick-fil-A. We serve a chicken sandwich. This is what we do. We're closed on Sunday. You either like it or you don't. That's fine. They don't try to fight with bass or or major league fishing. They just do their own thing. And they're eating up their own market share because they're just like, hey, we're just going to do this. And you either like the product or you don't. And that should be how a business is run. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, and I love it that they're fishing fall. Yes. I mean, yes. Tough time. I mean, I'm out here struggling at times to find fish, and I'm catching only little small ones. I know the big ones are there, but I'm fishing for them. I want to see those guys struggle just like we do. I mean, they're pros. Let me see how they handle that struggle, not how they go out and find the ones on face forward-facing sonar all the time. Why do you think they hate yeah, But I learn a lot from it. Because it's tough. Mm. I honestly believe it. I mean, come on, I go out and let's say I catch 30 of them and they're a pound, pound and a half. They don't want to see pound, pound and a half. They want to see the threes and the fours. And I love to catch threes and fours, but if you you got to go through all those small ones to find them. I mean, I like having that nice rough thumb when I come home. I agree with you. I agree. And I really love the COVID year. Um, it really did conjumble things up, but to see some of these lakes in the fall and how much different they are, it, it's, it's weird almost when you're always used to seeing a Lake Hartwell or a, a Sandy Cooper in, you know, late, late spring or early spring, I'm sorry. And then to see it in like October and then to see Lake Fork in November. Cause I think a lot of people, that aren't in the fishing zeitgeist like we are don't understand that like fall has this weird bounce effect where the fishing goes down in the fall, but then like late fall, winter, that weird couple of weeks between the fall and winter, the fishing goes off the chain and they start eating like crazy. And we saw that at Lake Fork. I mean, granted, I get it like forward facing sonar helped him out a little bit, but he, he we, they hit Lake Fork at such a great time in that fall to winter transition where those fish started to feed heavily. Uh, and, and you catch big ones. I mean, big ones at that time yeah. because they've been feeding up. Yeah. I mean, that's why we haven't caught them. They've been chasing bait around and just a little more difficult. So it's, you know, they're getting bigger. And then all of a sudden, everything starts to line for us to be able to do what we want. I mean, 
I'm still on the same bait year round and catching fish off of it. So it's no different, but I mean, it's just, I know where they're going to be and they're coming out of here and there they are. And I can st- sit there all day and throw in that same place and catch fish after fish after fish. No, 100%. Then, guys, keep loading up. The number is 667-307-8583. We are talking about everything that's going on with Forward Facing Center. MPFL is banning it. Uh, those comment sections are going in flames. Bruce, thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it. Did you want to give a shout out to anything you did? You just had an article drop, right, uh, the other day? Um, I had one dro- I had one today. Well, I had the one in the newsletter. Uh, came out on the 1st. And I had one today about the an opinion about the banning the forward facing sonar, and then I'm supposed to have one come out this week about my baits for September. Ooh, so, guys, all up on the Bass Cast. Yeah, go on head over to the Bass Cast. Look at Bruce's article. He also has a podcast episode with me dropping. Uh, I th- believe it's next week. I better check my schedule here, uh, which is going to be a great conversation as well. Go check that out, um, Bruce. Thank you so much for calling in. I really appreciate it, dude. Oh, my pleasure, man. Let's get out in the kayaks. Sounds like a plan, man. I think, again, guys, this has been uh, absolutely... I enjoy this. I really enjoy this type of style where we get to talk to the people and what you guys think about this thing. It's not just my dumb ass just spouting for two hours nonsense, nonsensical garbage because guess what? I don't get to fish as much as I'd like to. I would love to fish BFLs and Toyotas and all that stuff, but I'm chained in a basement making radio show talking about this stuff. But these comments about forward-facing center being like the Black Lives Matter movement is just, I, why are we here in fishing? I don't understand any of this stuff. Um, here's another great one here that we're going to be talking about here on a different show, which would be uh, this fantastic one, which is, uh, it's not even fishing. It's a video game. Forward facing sonar should be banned from tournaments. Use it. It's a total disgrace to the sport and ruins the entire hierarchy of talent. It, I would love somebody to come on that absolutely hates video games to describe that. It, I just don't understand the sycophantic hate because, again, when you use video games as the describer there of like, well, it's like a video game. So you hate video games. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So because you see it on the screen, it's not a fish. That was interesting, again, with the words of MPFL. It's like, it's pixels. You're not catching a fish. Okay, but you're staring at pixels regardless, whether it's side scan and all the other stuff. So, like, that part of your argument's interesting because, like, so you mean graphs. You're against graphs? Because if you mean staring at pixels specifically in the wording, you can kind of insinuate some things there where you just don't like graphs in general, which is fine, so why stop there? I think if he just takes the first half of his statement and keeps that first half perfectly fine, I think he has a great argument to be made here. Let me pull that back up. But when he got into that other piece there about like the pixels, I feel like that could have been edited or reworded a little differently. Or, 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 that was worded correctly. That's what he was supposed to say because it is a tailored message to the boomers. This was a tailored message when he said right here, uh, we do not want competitive fishing to become a technology arms race where anglers stare at, at a screen targeting pixels and losing their connection to the fish we love so much. You know, I thought maybe that was a blunder on his part saying that, but honestly, maybe it's tailored because it's specifically preaching to the people that hate technology. It's specifically tailored, that wording highlighted, to promote people that don't like forward-facing sonar. So again, I guess that would be some way to look at it from a business perspective is the reason he's stating all that that way is the fact that he's trying to really hype up that base to get them involved here. And again, I think it is absolutely the most brilliant thing that MPFL could do. It's fantastic marketing. They're the first one through the door. Really smart here. Tip of the cap to them. And honestly, I will say this right now. If, if, if the other two organizations follow suit and say like, hey, listen, we are going to ban forward-facing sonar, if that happens and then MPFL comes out the next day and says, like, we're going to allow it, I'm going to buy all of them at MPFL a gift card to Chick-fil-A because that is brilliant. Their their strategy of being different, being different and doing their own thing. I just I think that's a very interesting marketing approach versus MLF again. MLF and Bass are basically like trying to do this weird, you know, face off with Nicolas Cage and John Travolta about trying to be the one. Versus them just like, we're just trying to be different from you guys and just do our own thing and play in the corner and we're fine. Um, I don't know. 
And then we get into the thoughts here of the MPFL. Um, why? Because it should mean they'll get more big name fishermen, which has already helped their profile perception and will help them in other ways beyond just making for more of a compelling watch. More sponsors probably paying more attention, more sponsors maybe wanting to reach the MPFL non forward facing sonar audience. And we talk about, you know, the number one, or sorry, number two there, which I think is big, which is right here, which is I expect bass to take the lead here because they are the origins of tournament bassing and the 800 grill in the room. I don't mean lead with a ban, just thought they would be first to announce what they are going to do. Nope. Nope. Because they, they are not, they don't lead. I would love to know how people figured out bass is leading. They lead from behind. They don't talk, they don't do anything unless it's safe. They are the most corporate organization. Them and Major League Fishing, they're basically the same thing. They're two two halves of the same coin. Again, I keep saying the Chick-fil-A thing because like Chick-fil-A will come out that's like, these are our principles, we're standing on it, and we're okay if you you hurt us financially. How do I know that? Because they're closed on Sunday. They have they have virtues, they're fine with it. And because of that, because they have values that they believe in, they have a cult following. They do. Good for them. Bass and Major League Fishing, I just feel like they're going to stick their finger up in the air and wherever the wind blows, they're going to be that. If, if tomorrow everyone said we should cook and eat bass, they would be out there talking about the best recipes for largemouth bass. They would. If they thought that's where the cultural zeitgeist was blowing. They have not shown me yet to have the ethics to at least say, hey, listen, we're bass. This is what we're going to do. Take it or leave it. We don't care. Awesome. Great. Tip of the cap. That's who you are. Don't change again, though. Just stick with those morals. Um... I don't know. It's going to be interesting. And I, why do I pick on bass more than like major league fishing? Cause major league fishing is more newish compared to them. Same thing with MPFL bass has been around for 200 years. This is their thing. I don't know. It's just going to be interesting to see how all the tea leaves fall here with all this stuff. I really do. And so we're going to get some questions here before we get going here with this show. It's a little tricky to make out at first. If you're not used to it because the blurry images, they're a little And they reappear. Oh, you're talking about forward facing center. Sorry. I thought you were talking about me sharing the screen, Josh. My bad. I was like, wait a minute. He's talking about oh yeah. And then that's the that's the reason why people get bigger screens for their forward facing sonar units. I get it. I'm wearing glasses because I'm getting old because time comes for us all and death we can't not get away from. And so when you saw Rick Clun with that 22 inch live scope screen, we laugh at first, but then we look at it and we're like, son of a bitch, I can see stuff now. I get it. So it's not just the money thing. It's so you can see shit easier. You know, I don't know how people use a three inch screen or a three inch screen. <coughs> I don't know how people use a tiny screen and see with forward and facing sonar. But maybe that's why it's a young person's game is because you got great eyes. Your eyes have been killed. It's probably they're also good at video games. They can see shit a lot better than I can. Like the green palette is supposed to be the best palette for forward facing sonar. I, Maybe I'm colorblind to green. I, I Green doesn't work for me. I like that amber palette a lot more for some reason. I don't know why. Green just does not work for me. I got a cough. <coughs> <clears throat> but yeah, so I, I don't I don't know there. Yeah, I'm just talking about, yeah, it's okay, boss. It's my bad. My brain's working way too over high. Again, guys, uh, 6-6-7-3-0-7-8-5-8-3 is the number. Uh, we got a couple people to drop off there. Sorry about that. I get in too many rants, and I just got to make sure we get through all these questions here. Let's see. I got a couple more questions to get through, and then we'll be we'll be calling this show. We got Michael again. Haha, green sucks for me. I'm old. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's not just me. I don't know why. All my younger friends are like, yeah, green is the shit. Why do you use this? And like, dude, I... It doesn't, I don't get the separation with my eyes. I don't know why. It just doesn't work. I'll use it when I'm night fishing or something like that. So my eyes don't bleed. But the, like, yeah, that that weird amber one is is chef's kiss. It's the best one for me. Uh, we got Will says, uh, we as a country and species are tribal in nature. Yep. Cowboys versus Redskins fans, Yankees and the Red Sox. Um we will just find a new topic, tool, technique, et cetera, to be a uh, divisive over. Everyone just needs to chill and go enjoy. It. Yeah, go touch some grass. I agree. Go touch it. Go smoke it. Go relax. It's not that big a deal. Because <clears throat> in the end, it's just fun. You learn a lot more. Like When I first got forward facing center, the amount I just drove around and looked at fish like a dumbass, just, just looking at fish. And the most fun I had this past winter was tying on a crappie jig and just 
what am I looking at? Let me catch what I'm looking at. I think a lot of people that really <clears throat> are really getting good at four facing sonar and I, I, you know, McCluskey, SB fishing, people like that were like, yep, that's a three pound bass. You know, that's a carp. That's a Ford F-150. That's 20 bucks. They can see all this shit on the screen, but you forget that childhood wonder of going out there the first time with like a little crappie jig and be like, I don't know what that is. And you cast to it to see what it is. I still remember that because like a year and some change ago, that was fun to go out there in the winter time. I was like, oh, what is this? That's a crappie. Oh, that's a bluegill. Oh, that's a little bass. It, there's that wonderment there that's so much fun. And that's honestly what I'm looking forward to again is crappie season and getting out there again. I can't wait to take the stuff on salt water and looking around and seeing some stuff. I'm scared shitless because if I see a shark, I will crap myself. But I'm going to hopefully take the kayak out this fall, I'm hoping, uh, at Virginia Beach and just to look around and see all that stuff. Because it is, it's fun just to see stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I love Sega and Nintendo for the record. Okay, there you go. You see, we got somebody that does like video games. It, and again, I was like, it, even just line up your cast, there's sometimes, again, so I'm a river smallmouth guy up on the River Potomac where I'm at. And in that, that October to really January ish time period, those fish in that part of the river, even though we're in like 20 foot holes, the current's ripping, those fish are tacked to the bottom. You can't see them until you throw your bait out there and they, they come off the bottom somewhat so you can see it because it's a hard return with the rock. They have to move or something because you literally won't see them no matter what you have your setting set to. And so what you end up doing is you're casting to the boulders. And you're checking to see if there's movement. If there's movement, then you can do some different things there. And and my point in that is just using the scope to line up your cast is amazing. Whether it's a brush pile or for me when you're fishing for smallmouth and you're fishing boulders and stuff, you know, I can look at, and this is something I showed, like, yeah, I think, I think it was McCluskey, I think it was McCluskey, but showed him that too, fishing for smallmouth. We're like, you look like there's nothing in that boulder. It looks like there's nothing. You fire your drop shot out. And as it hits the bottom, one just comes, like just appears and comes right up over there. Um, so it's even fascinating with the technology, like fish can still disappear on you and you, and you can't see them. So it, it is, it is just a crazy world, man. It's a crazy world that we're in right now with this stuff. And, and again, it's, it's sad because I have some episodes with biologists tuned up. Um, if you guys don't know, I did a bunch of episodes with the heads of the Maryland department of wildlife resources. I have a new episode that'll be dropping later in September with the guy that runs the Eastern shore of Maryland. So that's going to be fun. And then we're going to be talking about, um, the smallmouth bass program again for the shander we got so many fun episodes for virginia coming out a ton of pre-recorded episodes going this winter for next next spring and it's just fascinating that they love the technology they're trying to use drones to count fish they're trying to use forward-facing sonar with ai in the future to be able to like say like oh that's a blue catfish and then that's a striped bass and then we can calculate how many are in the river dude it's gonna make their job so much easier so this technology is not going away. It's going to get so much better. Like drone technology has gotten insane how cheap it is. And that's something else. Like why aren't drones used more? Because good God, to be able to use a drone to see if you could get back into some of these bays and stuff on the James River or the Potomac, like that would be pretty, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's probably illegal, but you know, there's something else right there you could do. You look at how they're dropping baits to sharks. Why couldn't you drop your frog to a bass? Like, that would be kind of awesome. Uh, I listened to an interview with with Brad, and I think he's basically a marketing genius, and the MPFL is going to have a huge niche market. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think I think it's it's 100% marketing. They're, they're Be the first one to the party, best dress, I think 100%. Um, how will they regulate this? I personally think what they're going to do, <clears throat> when we talk about regulating this, it's all you got to do. It's just take off the puck off the front of the boat. Now, granted, if you're a professional, I think it's a lot easier because you can have your crew or you can move stuff on and off your boat way easier and get it fine tuned. I think this would be way more annoying, personally speaking, or could be wrong for the blue collar guy to be like, hey, listen, this Saturday, the tournament's no forward facing sonar. You need to rip off your forward-facing sonar. Next Saturday, it is a forward-facing sonar tournament. You got to go add it back on and make sure it, it all is fine-tuned and stuff. I think that's more annoying for the blue-collar guy just because that's not your day job, so you don't have that extra time to throw into it. Not a deal-breaker. I just think it would be a little bit a little bit more annoying for the regular folk. Um, give a legitimate reason to ban FFS. Don't we all have a creek and bag limits? I 100% agree with that, boss man. I really do. Uh, we got a couple more comments here. 
We got uh, Brian Barry. Uh, I think all of the revenue you'd get if you were the only tour not to not to ban it. I do. I agree. It's, and if we're gonna do the steroid analogy or or, or monster trucks, it, like I want to see the spectacle, dude. If Barry Bonds wants to grow a third head and hit a ball 800 feet and just decapitate the pitcher, as long as they sign a waiver form, I'll watch it. I got that morbid curiosity. I would like to see somebody catch, you know, all eight pounds smallmouth or something crazy like that. Okay, I'll watch that tournament. That's fine. I'll watch both. I mean, what what Ito did on Smith Lake catching those massive spotted bass, it's just sometimes fun to see those freaky sized fish. It really is. But again, I don't mind watching the stuff like the frog fishing people keep talking about. Just go somewhere that they can throw a goddamn frog. Lake Gunnersville. Please go protest what they're going to do down there as they murder that lake. Um, you know, Seth throwing into a tree. How many places actually have a tree? Uh, BFL nightmare. No, 100% agree with that. Uh, BFL would be a nightmare. Because again, it's like, depending on, do you just want me to take off the transducer or just the black box? If it's the black box, it's a non-starter. I, I will not fish a tournament organization, period, right now. Because I have the money invested. Like, it's one thing, I guess, it, if the thought process is I don't have it, then you're okay. But if you've already invested, I just don't see them doing that. That'd be such a pain in the ass to say, like, by the way, yeah, I know you've invested all this time and effort and money. F you. <clears throat> Take it off your boat. If you're going to be an organization being like, just move the black puck off your trolling motor, eh... It's still, it's just, I'm not gifted technologically wise. Like, if I take that off, unthread it through my boat... I, I have a day job. I run this stupid podcast, which is basically a job in of itself. I have a family. I have a wife. I have She is my family and my dogs. That's part of the family. I don't have as much time to be like, okay, I need to have an extra day to rethread the boat with the stuff to go to the tournament. So to me, it'd be like, that's just more of a hassle. Maybe if I was a professional and that's all I did and I could a lot more time potentially, I'm making arguments up in my head to try to play both sides of the fence here. It just, it's just, it's more of a nuisance. I feel like I speculate that I want to see an angler struggle to figure out hard situations. Uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I think I, I, you know, what would be fun. Let's put a, let's put some of these people that are not technologically gifted with forward facing sonar, force them to use it and then put another camera in the boat of a young kid that doesn't have it and make it so he doesn't have it. So let's do a little like Freaky Friday switch. You're a 20 year old good technology, boom, John Boat. You go out there, John Cox it. Hey, you are terrible with a smartphone and can't send an email, boom, you can only catch it with forward facing sonar. Let's watch that death match on YouTube because that shit would break the internet. I'm telling you right now, okay? Boomer versus Gen Alpha, go. That would be awesome. Now you might not like it because it might make a few jokes at people, but that would be kind of funny. Give the young kid just the most old school stuff possible he has to go out there all day and give the other person that has technology all the technology but they only get to use it it wouldn't be a sh it would be more of a show than a tournament format but i would love to actually watch that that'd be fun uh josh said uh, i heard about them spraying down gunnersville when the fuck is this shit gonna stop what the fuck yeah it's bad um <clears throat> we had a couple actually luckily a couple more uh channels let me actually pull this guy up because I want to make sure I say things correctly. Uh, Mikey Balls. I'm so bad at this. Mikey Ballsen. <clears throat> he just posted because he lives on Lake Gunnersville. He talked about the spring. I've talked about the spring. Just give us. I, I keep saying it. Just give us one lake. Please, please, please. Please. Just give us one lake. Each state. I ask you this. Let us have one lake in each state where it's just fishing first. Everyone else just go pound sand. Gunnersville, I would think that would be the lake in Alabama that you'd be like, this is fishing first. This is our this is our Fenway Park. This is our Wrigley Field. Texas, give us two lakes. Give us Toledo Bend and Lake Fork, I think. And then all the rest of them you can have. But just give us one lake in each state that's us first. But the idea that they're going to try to kill Gunnersville, you have every other lake in that state that you've killed the grass in. And again, I would love to look at the economics. Of like, I get there's six rich people that have a dock there, but that community is not as big as the fishing community. But Alabama, Alabama to me makes no sense. It is the mega of fishing. Uh, somehow, I don't know why it's not Texas or Florida. Somehow Alabama became like, it's we're the mecca of fishing. The Carolinas, like they're not, it's Alabama, but they hate their anglers. They hate their anglers. And I don't get that. At least Texas, I've talked to a lot of people in Texas. The Texas departments, they really like their anglers. They respect their anglers. Florida, I don't. I'm up on the wall, 50-50 on them. 
but Texas actually like likes hunters and fishermen and stuff, which is kind of cool, but that's not considered like the bass Mecca. Alabama, I don't think they really care about their anglers because their lakes are crap. Like their lake maintenance is just crap. It's all about the homeowners associations and the TVA. And it's not about environmentalism or protecting fishing or anything like that. Look at Tennessee and uh, Tennessee and um, TVA there. Sorry, uh, the TVA, not the Tennessee. And the Carolinas are trying to do a better job. And it, Carolinas are having this issue too with the grass carp and, and the grass management. And that's like the one thing I want to do before I die is just to talk to people and convince them that having grass in a lake is not bad. It's okay to have a little bit of grass. You'd be surprised at how much better these fisheries would be and how much better the water quality would be when you can just let some grass live. And I know North Carolina went on this huge spurt of just like, if it's green, kill it. And it's just, yeah, Mikey. Yeah, Mikey. Yeah, it's Mikey. It was a great video he did. I'm trying to get him on the show to talk specifically about that because that'd be good. Now, I can't believe that all the pros who live on Gunnersville or that is their home like aren't more vocal about this. That's not because I I really think professional anglers are basically politicians. They're not going to stick their necks out for anything. Now, and this is again, I will give Scott Martin a lot of props here. Scott Martin is very vocal about protecting Lake Okeechobee. I understand some people will have a jaded opinion. Like it's, it's, it's an interest because financially, because his home is there, it's still the right thing to do. And he does it where he talks big about Okeechobee water levels and making sure Okeechobee is good. And maybe there's another interest there because of his other businesses, but he is the only super mega star angler that I know at his level that's talking about conservation of lakes at all. So props to him there. Cause if you would bring that back and Michael talks about this with like Gaston, Gaston was the best frog like 20, uh, 20 in 2014, unbelievable before they killed it all. Yeah. And, and now, now the spotted bass is just taking it over. And again, I, who is making these decisions? Um, and then if you guys, and then I think this is actually a great time to talk about this too. I saw it in Florida in January, going down to fishing the Toyota, all the sprayed areas and all the dead vegetation is terrible. And then forward facing center becomes more important because when you kill all the grass, it concentrates the fish offshore in places and that makes them more susceptible to the scope. And then people's thought again is like, get rid of the scope versus we just fix our fisheries. Um, but that's a really good segue for this because all my Patreon supporters already know about this, but we are working the paperwork right now. We have it. The We are starting our nonprofit. Hopefully next year, it'll be 100% official. It is going to be casting for conservation. It is the nonprofit 501c3 that we're going to be taking up. I told you guys I was going to be getting this thing going. Again, it's going to be casting for conservation. Our focus is going to be supplemental stocking our local fisheries. Let's get some F1s into the Potomac River. Let's get the fish populations back up in all of our local bodies of water. Let's help actually increase our smallmouth in some of our smallmouth rivers. And also we're going to be doing local boat ramp facility restorations. This was another big pet peeve of mine um, when I wanted to start a nonprofit was not just to do supplemental fish stockings, but also there's so many boat ramps that just suck. Whether it's the Rappahannock River, the Shenandoah, the James, Sleater's Lake, at Nye Reservoir, there's some really crappy boat ramps out there. Part of the nonprofit's goal was going to also be raising money to help actually polish up and clean up some of these boat ramps so they're nicer for fishermen. Um, and we also want to raise awareness for just different bodies of water and how we can protect them. Again, so if you guys don't know, I'm making the announcement now. We are getting this nonprofit going. It's going to be Casting for Conservation is the name of the 501c3. Our next goal is we're only 90 Patreon supporters actually away from hitting our major grow goal to get this bad boy up for um, Casting for Conservation. So we're only 90 away. We have the logo, which I'm going to make the announcement tomorrow for the logo for Casting for Conservation so everyone can see it. Also, I will be sending out the business plan to all of my Patreon supporters so they can see the mission statement and our whole goal for the nonprofit. But yeah, we're only 90 Patreon supporters away from starting our uh, Casting for Conservation 501c3 so we can actually start doing bass stockings of our local waterways F1s in the Potomac River, baby. We can start actually getting some of these fisheries looking better, smallmouth fishing, all that, and also fixing up some boat ramps. So I had to do that little plug to keep the lights on and stuff. For all the photo contest stuff for Patreon supporters, we are going through all the photos right now. We are going to be making an announcement for the photo contest giveaway tomorrow. And uh, I think we're going to pick six or seven winners, I think, this year. This year, I think we're picking six or seven winners for the month of August. So that we're going to be doing that as well. And last thing is I'm trying to get in hold of somebody. We're going to be doing 
fishing tournaments, monthly fishing tournaments, catch photo, release tournaments uh, for Patreon supporters. That's going to be a monthly thing we're going to start doing. I'm just trying to figure out the right application because I don't really want to initially charge people extra. And X X Zone or whatever that one app is, they want to charge people an extra six bucks per person to actually like use the application. And I really don't want to charge Patreon supporters twice. So I will be, uh, I'll be looking into that as well. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully we'll be getting that figured out as well. But anyway, guys, as always like subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out in the algorithm. Thank you guys so much for everyone that watched in tonight. Please, 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 please go leave us a review on Apple podcasts. The next big thing that we're going to be doing is trying to promote this thing on Apple podcasts so we can rang up the charts. I want to make this thing a top 100 show. I know we're a young show compared to like, you know, Bass Talk Live and stuff, but I think we can start punching above our weight class. Like, subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.